Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning, good evening, depending where you're joining from the world. So yes, thank you for the introduction, Adam. Um, I'm going to talk about the new silver standard uh, here from Catalytic Instruments, the silver particle generator, which is undergoing some characterization at this very moment. So particle generation, um, this is something not particularly uh, new to anybody here. So looking back through the Heinz textbook, uh, I, I was interested to see that he defined something of an ideal aerosol generator, which would be constant, reproducible, monodispersed aerosol, stable, uncharged, solid, spherical, size and concentration controlled, and of a uniform material. So there are reasons why that would make a, uh, a, good, a good aerosol for testing. So solid particle generation. Um, we have collison nebulizers um, where you can evaporate the solvent. They're simple. Uh, you can use these uh, readily available. But the issue is that they're somewhat unstable in concentration and size, and they have a high RH output. So they're, they're somewhat variable. They're quick and dirty and quite good to get running and, and be operational with, but there's, uh, there are challenges with these. And then we have dry dispersion. Sorry, my, uh, my slides are advancing. Dry dispersion. So for example, we've got this TSI generator here, um, which has a high buildup of charge on the aerosol and some concentration variation. There's typically a wide GSD and the, the aerosol is often large, uh, large aerosol targeted as well and suffers somewhat from agglomerates um, in part due to the charging and other mechanisms. Further solid particle generation, we have the electrospray units, which uh, some of you may have had the fortune or misfortune to have operated. Um, sounds somewhat unfair. They're, they're actually, they're, they're pretty good, um, but they're somewhat complex instruments and they have a radioactive requirement. And uh, with, with using PSLs, you can suffer from doublets and surfactant issues and, and things like this. So they're pretty complicated, but they can work very well. And these are used with emery oil and other materials for CPC calibrations, for example. Um, for soot generators as well, uh, we have, of course, already talked about the, the mini cast systems um, and uh, there are inverted burners as well. Um, they're somewhat dirty to, to use and operate. Um, they have high concentrations, however, um, somewhat variable output TCOC uh, issues and uh, the inorganic compounds can int introduce uncertainties. Uh, tube furnaces, um, however, they're somewhat fiddly, um, but they are stable when they're set up, though they can suffer from high variability. Often you can set them up to operate quite well, however. Um, here's some TEM images of size-selected silver nanoparticles taken from such a, uh, a furnace. Um, these are sintered after generation to, uh, to make them even more spherical, even at the larger sizes. And this is kind of the direction uh, that the silver particle generator uh, has gone in. So it uses air as a carrier gas. Um, aerosol size range is somewhere in the region of 2.5 to 100 nanometers of solid aerosol. More on that later. Stable for hours, day to day. Uh, the aerosol is spherical and predicted agglomerates in the larger phase. Aerosol flow is between two and 15 liters per minute that can be controlled um, via uh, dilution that's built in, integrated into the device, and it has a touchscreen interface. There are primarily at the moment two modes of operation with the device that I will uh, show data from. We have a kind of uh, obviously named mode one and a mode two. So mode one is a smaller, less than 10 nanometer GMD aerosol. And then mode two is a larger than 10 nanometer GMD or greater than and larger to 10 nanometers. So if you wanted to measure 10 nanometer aerosol specifically, you might want to use mode two, for example. In terms of aerosol stability then from the generator, the left-hand axis is the DND log DP and the right hand of the GMD for both modes um, separately. So here you can see GMD of around seven nanometers constant throughout daily operation. There is more variation in total concentration though throughout any given day. So each, each one of these, uh, each block of three is a, is a day. So there's a morning, afternoon and late afternoon. 
um, the variability throughout a day is is relatively low. So the variability between days is something that we're that we're working on, though it's still relatively relatively good. Okay, so then if we look at number and size, uh, we have low variability in concentration in GMD for any series of measurements that are being taken at any one time. So across SMPS scans and things, the aerosol is remarkably stable. And here, this graph on the right shows concentration downstream of the DMA. So this is not SMPS scans. This is DMA set point here. Excuse me. This is DMA set point here. And each one is the measured concentration downstream of the CPC. So if you were doing calibrations of your devices somewhere between yes, zero and 100 nanometers, you have over 1,000 particles per centimeter cubed downstream of a DMA. So coming back to the particle generation slide, we have, uh, we have constant to a point. We have re reproducible to a point, stable, solid, size and concentration controlled, and the uniform material because we're using silver. So we're, we're ticking off a few of these uh, defined ideal aerosol generator points here. This is leaving us with monodisperse, uncharged, and spherical. So let's look at these in a bit more detail. So monodispersicity, I'm not sure if that's a word, but I'm, I'm going to use it today. Um, we have on the left axis GSD, so the geometric standard deviation. Um, of, of the aerosol, so how tight that distribution is basically. And you can kind of assume in, in a sense that we have um, here a monodispersed region, arguably below 1.2 in GSD or 1.1 for many people, but let's let's just call it in this shaded, shaded region. So the set points here, uh, without any further editing, if you like, of, of our conditions, we're seeing GSDs in this region, which is highly favorable for calibration, um, especially of, uh, say, CPC um, uh, D50. However, I'll, I'll come to that later, it still might be beneficial to use a DMA downstream to really get this distribution nice and tight. Okay, so aerosol properties in a bit more detail. On the left, we have uh, typical SMPS setup here, so SPG, and then going to an SMPS. On the right, we have aerodynamic diameter, so SPG going to the combustion AAC, and then a CPC. So mode one and mode two here, um, essentially they're showing the same properties depending on how you're looking at the aerosol, but on the left, we're looking at electrical mobility diameter, and on the right, we have the much larger, in effect, because of the density, aerodynamic diameter. So how does that affect shape? We know the density of silver, and therefore we can back calculate the diameter of the particles. Uh, we can simply plug in, I say simply, it is not simple at all. Tyler's written a fantastic paper on, on how you can do this. Plug in the data and, uh, and using the density, you can back calculate what the particle size uh, should be um, and therefore define the shape as well. And the interesting thing here, the really interesting thing, is the difference here that we see between the peak of the SMPS and the AAC. Some of this is expected, but not a factor of 10. So we're seeing a factor of 10. I say some of this is expected, and that would be due to the charging distribution. So the AAC, of course, doesn't require a charger, and the SMPS does. And the aerosol through the AAC then will be a higher fraction, but we don't expect 10 times. So whether there's diffusion losses coming in that are not being accounted for or not is something that is under investigation. Here's an example of TEM as well in the bottom. So you can see that the aerosol uh, collected on these TEM grids with a 20 nanometer size here, about the size of my laser pointer, they're pretty spherical. So again, coming back to the ideal aerosol generator, so we've got monodispersed and spherical now, and actually I'm, I'm going to draw a line for uncharged because uh, it's actually beneficial to have, to have charge on the aerosol, especially if you want to put it through a DMA. Um, you can do things with charge, you can impose a charge, you can try and neutralize a charge. Uh, we're investigating how the aerosol from the SPG is charged, even what charge states are we seeing. It's very small aerosol in general, especially in the smaller mode, so we don't expect many, many multiple charges. 
So in using the SPG, it has a less than 15 minute warm up time. Uh, so it can be operational within half an hour or so. High concentration, two to 15 liters per minute outflow. It has a very low RH, less than 5% RH on the output and is operated by a touchscreen interface. So here's an example of a CPC calibration, which I needn't go into too much detail of. It's relatively simple. Uh, really, you go backwards and forwards across different particle diameters to derive this sigmoid curve, excuse me, this sigmoid curve here, um, figuring out what your D50 cut of your CPC is. And our CPC was pretty much within calibration spec. So that's one application of the, of the SPG there. Future work entails using nitrogen as a carrier gas to try and uh, examine if silver oxide poses any threat. Um, additional operational set points as well. I've illustrated here a potential third mode, which um, has done some testing, but I don't have data from, uh, from that to show you here today, apart from this size distribution. Um, investigate in more detail agglomerate formation and a sinter an impossible sintering stage. So the silver particle generator in summary is an ideal instrument in many senses for a variety of instrument calibrations and, in and aerosol research. It can be used in laboratory and also in the field, weighs less than 25 kilograms and is relatively low maintenance compared to competitive products. So I would like to thank with that uh, a lot of this data has come from Tobias Hammer at, uh, at Metas, who is working with, uh, with us as part of the Metro PEMS project, uh, where this device is being tested for its suitability for PEMS calibration. And with that, uh, I will draw my presentation to a close. So thank you very much, and I look forward to any questions. Great. Thanks so much, Martin. We do have a few questions, um, and again, for those that are that are joining late, um, we're using Slido as our, our Q and A function. Uh, Molly, maybe you could drop that in the chat again. So, um, Martin, Martin, Martin Fierts asked, um, when you make larger particles, aren't they fractal? My experience with tube furnaces, presumably, is that they're fractal. That's mine as well, actually. So, could could you answer that? Right. Great. Great question. So, in our current larger mode. Um, which is not the largest mode that that we see. Um, hopefully, this is this is large enough. Uh, if I remove the notes panel as well, maybe that's large enough. You can see some TEM images. So previously, I showed the I would arguably say nicer TEM from the uh, from the smaller mode. Looking at the larger mode, um, this was if I in fact activate the slideshow. I can also do this. This is where this TEM was taken. So upstream of the DMA. There are questions we have at the moment as to what these smaller particles surrounding the larger kind of bean shaped particle here um, are. Uh, these are approaching yeah, 20, 30 nanometers, something like that. So we're going to measure here before the CPC as well downstream. Um, great question. And in fact, yes, do expect fractal aggregates of some degree. And in fact, they're desired for an unsintered stage. And then whether we sinter or not, depending on customer requirement, um, I think it's something that we would offer. Great, thanks, Martin. Um, the next question comes from James Allen. Could the charging efficiency referred to in the DMA AAC comparison be due to the silver having different dielectric properties to what's typically assumed? That is another great question. So the the charging, great question. I don't have an answer for that, and that's something that we're investigating. So that's. Um, that is a very good point because already um, it is well known and documented that soots have certain charging efficiencies, that various different particles have charging efficiencies, and likewise silver um, charges in a different way. So I do expect that that makes up some of the difference, though the factor of 10, I still think there's a big chunk of diffusion correction stuff that we need to look into here to, uh, to eliminate as well. But great point, James. Okay. Um... Martin has a couple other questions, but maybe I'll, I'll take a few um, a few other ones. So Mosin says, any idea what the retail price for the unit will be? <laughs> um, I would say get in touch uh, with me uh, behind the scenes, and, and, and we can we can discuss that. Um, I would say competitive and also uh, in line with other aerosol uh, equipment across the board. Okay, and then Reza says, do you have recirculation zone in the tube? 
The large and small particles remind me of remind me of particles formed when the recircula recirculation zone is present. That's a very, very interesting question. Um, very interesting. In theory, no, there shouldn't be any dead zone or recirculation. Um, this is this is a very simplified schematic of, of what we've got here. So uh, the heater and then almost a, a kind of tube environment where the silver is at the is at the bottom and is heated and then yeah convected uh, upwards and condenses very good point i think that's something to to investigate improving say flow um we've, we do have modeling on the case as well um, but i don't have data to show from that but great great thought great question okay and then we, we still have a, a couple of minutes here so martin fierts ask um what temperature are you making internally for the evaporation? Well, I'll well, answer that one first, and I'll go on to the second ones. What what temperature do we have for the evaporation? Yeah, internally, I think the question is is you know perhaps where where is temperature being measured, and how does that how is it inferred to an yep, internal? Yeah, great. Temperature? So temperature is uh, not directly measured of the silver, um, of course, for, for multiple reasons. Um, I won't go into too much detail about exactly how the temperature is, is, me is measured, but it is controlled um, to be the same every time, if you like, uh, from a variety of other tests of temperature throughout the entire device and entire region. So we've chosen what we think to be the best way to get controlled, stable aerosol formation. Um, generally, the, the device is brought up to above the melting point of silver and then brought back down a touch to, uh, to a specific set point where we get our mode one and mode two. So those two have different temperature set points. Great. And then the final question from Martin, or, or a couple of questions are, how are you sampling for the TM, anything that could produce those satellites? That's a that's a good question. I don't have too much uh, info on the TEM because I'm I'm not actually uh, I'm not taking those. Those are underway in in Bern uh, at Metas, and they are I believe standard kind of um, filter TEM grids where you where you simply pop them in line um, with no other activity required. So a very passive system is my understanding, but that will be all part of the yeah, future documentation that we put together. Great. I think that's it. Um, Martin, thanks once again. Thank you. For your presentation. Thank great. you for the great questions as well, everyone.